In yesterday's episode, I asked, has the front office unofficially set the timeline on this Bulls core? On today's episode, we're going to ask, have the Bulls set the timeline on head coach Billy Donovan? And if they have not, is it time to? We're also going to look at the Bulls officially signing a couple of players and dive into the mailbag. All that and more right after this. You are now tuned in to Chicago Bulls Central, your number one place for all Chicago Bulls news and content. What's going on, Bulls fans? Welcome to another episode of Chicago Bulls Central, your number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related. I'm the host here, Hayes. You guys can follow the channel right off the top at CEO Hayes on every social media platform that we happen to be on. But let's go ahead and get into the content for today. Just quick updates. The Bulls have officially signed Javon Carter to his two-year deal and Adama Sanago to a two-way contract. Now, these moves were all but expected. That's why I didn't have like an emergency episode or anything once these were announced. We've already broken down really both these players, how they could fit for the Chicago Bulls and the Windy City Bulls next season. And I really didn't feel like there was much left to add, but I do want to add in here just that those deals have been made official, and we'll see what the Bulls continue to do. Now, this has le- asked a question and led many fans now to ask, are the Chicago Bulls done with free agency? Now, we do have a potential $10 million disabled player exception coming in. We also are $10.6 million below the luxury tax, which means we could primarily use the rest of our mid-level exception if we choose to do so, or if we do decide to use that disabled player exception, it does not send us into the luxury tax because we've created enough space with the deals that we've gotten. They've been a low enough underneath the, uh, the their cap holds as well that we have you know opened up enough space now to use that disabled player exception in full without it sending us into the luxury tax. One of the biggest questions were, you know, were the Bulls even going to use that disabled player exception because it would have sent them into the luxury tax? So now the Bulls have, you know, they've done some maneuvering. And this is kind of why I always, once, you know, that that AK soundbite cl- came out and, you know, a, a lot of us Bulls content creators, we said, uh, you know, well, does that mean now that we're going to go into the luxury tax? Listen, this Bulls team is still, as much as things change, they stay the same around here. This team is not going to be paying the luxury tax, it seems like. They now have created a scenario for themselves which they can go into the luxury tax and add more talent, but I just don't know if I see them taking it. It's mainly because of the ownership group rather than anything else. Um, I think that if AK had his full you know, autonomy to do whatever he wanted, I do think that we probably would go into the luxury tax, but you know, strategically, not just for anyone. And I think you know, some Bulls fans look at this and, and give the luxury tax as like this thing that the Bulls will never be a contender until they do that, and that's not necessarily true. You just have to be smart. You have to be smart in how you draft. You have to be smart with your money and where you sign players. You have to be smart with your extensions. And as of right now, the Bulls' last few draft candidates have not quite hit the level you know, that some Bulls fans wanted, right? And that is really when you have to start looking at the draft history of Arturis Karnasova and Mark Eversley, right? We did go Patrick Williams, where, you know, of course, players after Patrick Williams decided to blossom, a Tyrese Halliburton when you look at stuff like that. The following season, we went Io DeSumo and Marco Simonovic, where I, I, I'm not I'm not as down on Io DeSumo as a lot of Bulls fans are. I look at him as a second-round pick and say there's still quite a bit of upside at 23 left there, and what he showed defensively, that's not usually what you get from second-round picks. Now, where, where they did make the mistake at, though, is that they gave Marco Simonovic the three-year deal with the partially guaranteed third year. Where they could have given that that three year deal to Io DeSumo, and we wouldn't even be in this scenario right now. When you look at how everything shakes out, right? We end up, you know, not guaranteeing the third year in, in uh, Marco Simonovic's deal. He's going back overseas. Imagine had we had another year of controlled contract under Io DeSumo, not having to give him an extension to really take a look at what he looks like in year three after a solid rookie season, a down sophomore season and we could have taken a look at him in this in in the third year now so you have to look at that Dalen Terry one of the least amount uh you know the least uh played rookie at his draft position in NBA history right and then this season right we move up we get Julian Phillips uh another player that you know has tons of upside especially as a defensive you know uh big in this game maybe even a three and D if he can get that shot working for him we also signed Undrafted rookie Adama Sanago, also unsigned uh, rookie last season, and, and Justin Lewis, who ends up tearing his ACL in training camp. But, you know, right now, there's there's the jury's still out on AK's drafting. And, you know, that that's not a positive thing. By that, I don't mean it's good. It's It doesn't look good right now, right? Patrick Williams, who still has 
tons of upside. I like Patrick Williams. I think he's going to eventually get there. 21 years old, still has tons of NBA play left ahead of him. But ultimately, we have not got drafted the players that have hit the stride or really helped increase the bull ceiling too much right now because they haven't developed in a way that, you know, we, we would have liked to see, right? So when you look at it, yeah, d- uh, d- uh, disabled player exception is still not approved. Io DeSumo is still unsigned. Carly Jones has a guaranteed date on his contract where it has to be guaranteed by uh, October 16th. So the Bulls still have car- quite a bit of time now uh, before they need to make a decision on Carly Jones if they need to open up a roster spot by, you know, removing that guaranteed part of his deal. But ultimately, the Bulls seem to be pretty much done in free agency. And the reason why I say that is that I do think that there is a, a, a realistic role, as I've been saying, where the Bulls do not use that uh, disabled player exception until maybe the tread deadline during the season. So we end up seeing how that works out for the team. Um, and we'll see if they end up. There's quite a bit of free agents still out there. There's quite some internal free agents we still have we can get for cheap, I, uh, i.e. my video that I did last night on, on uh, uh, Javante Green. So, you know, we'll end up seeing. We'll see what the Bulls end up doing. But, you know, to get bring it all back, right, yesterday's video, I asked, and have the Bulls unofficially set the timeline on this core? When you look at giving out two-year deals, three-year deals, keeping everything really, you know, in that two- to three-year time frame, everything cat-friendly as well, that could be where the Bulls need to pivot. But the bigger question that a lot of Bulls fans asked in me posting that, and rightfully so, is did this set the timeline also on head coach Billy Donovan, right? He got an extension. Still don't know how many years that extension is left for. Could be one year. Could be two years. Could be 15,000 years. We don't know. It's the Chicago Bulls. It's Billy Donovan. We don't know. But when you look at this, I, I do think as well, like, Billy, who may not want to go full rebuild, right, even though the Bulls touted him as somebody who was coming in to help with player development, they were going to build through the draft, things like that, they immediately start making moves to try to, to try to win now. And some, rightfully so, have questioned, is that more so a thing that, because Billy Donovan doesn't want to be on a rebuilding team, he doesn't want to develop young talent and lose. And you have to start asking yourself that question. If the Bulls have not set the timeline on Billy Donovan, it may very well be time to do so. Billy Donovan, 117 and 119 win-loss record in his career. We've lost more games than we've won since Billy Donovan has been the head coach of the Chicago Bulls. That's just facts. Now, everything is not Billy Donovan's fault. As much as I'm not a Billy Donovan guy, I can still admit everything's not his fault. Not his fault Lonzo Ball went down with injury. Not his fault that the front office decided to have two trade deadlines in a row in which they had a lot of non-activity. Not his fault that once they did get him a point guard, the team has Anytime the Bulls have a point guard, an actual point guard, not just somebody playing the role, which Io is a combo guard, the Bulls have a 60%, 60% win percentage. And that's not something to overlook. And yes, you can say, well, if, you're, if Billy Donovan's system is that reliant on having a point guard that has you know, a, a kind of a, a particular skill set, how realistic is that? It, is that for success then, right? Billy Donovan as well has had his own coaching issues. You look at uh, the stack team he had at one point in OKC. He's also had, you know, teams that didn't have a lot of talent that actually did make the playoffs and like that Chris Paul, Shea Gilgic Alexander, OKC Thunder. So, you know, there's, there's enough questions there, right? But I think ultimately looking at it for me is just if the Bulls have not set a timeline, they need to be having one in the back of their minds, right? Is that I, look, I say it all the time. You, coach, coaches have a shelf life in the NBA. Most do. Unless you're Eric Sposher, unless you're Greg Popovich, coaches have a shelf life, meaning that at some point with the same roster, it's just they're not going to get through anymore. That's not going to penetrate more. They lose their luster. Coaches sometimes just they can't stay up with the modern-day game. Now, again, we could talk about the roster construction all day. That is not on Billy Donovan. We've had a lack of size. But then when we went out and got some size in Andre Drummond, we didn't really always use it. Now, some of that also was on Drummond. But you have to start asking yourself that question. Not to say that everything is on Billy Donovan. That's not to say that. But that doesn't mean that another coach can't get more out of a similar or the same roster than Billy Donovan's able to do. And when you start asking yourself that question, you have to start looking at other options available. Like, is it more feasible to change the team? Or is it more feasible to change the coach that will better be able to utilize the team? That's just realistic conversations you have to ask yourself in leading an NBA franchise, right? And is Billy Donovan the coach that you want to hit your wagon to to really 
because at some point, unless the Bulls, unless Patrick Williams hits that ceiling, unless Daylon Terry hits that ceiling, and all of a sudden now the Bulls are looking like they can be a contending team with primarily this core, unless that happens, you have to ask yourself, is Billy Donovan the guy in the next leg of this franchise, the next leg, the next wave of whatever this team ends up taking, if they cannot find a way to salvage this core, is Billy Donovan the guy to lead that, right? You have to start asking yourself those questions. And if he's not, you got to cut tight. And so, you know, this is to, to present that question. Is it time to set that timeline? And if it is, what is the, does that timeline look like? And ultimately, it could come down to, hey, can, like, the, nobody's developed since Billy's been here, right? Yeah, you could say Kobe White, but he's the one, but even then had his first offseason, went and worked with his own dribbling coach, went and worked with DeMar DeRozan, right? And a lot of the things that Kobe did last season weren't really developing new skills. It was developing a new level of focus. And some of it, he became a better passer, absolutely. He's become a better defender over the last couple of seasons, but you have to ask yourself that. And as much as the magnifying glass needs to be on these players, it also needs to be on head coach Billy Donovan going into next season as we look and, and judge this kind of maybe this last leg of this version of the Chicago Bulls. Let me know what you guys think on all that down below. All right, let's go ahead and get into the voicemails for today. This first one, this one's from Matt. Yo, Hayes, it's Matt. What's going on, man? I heard uh, your response to my I.O. questions. I've heard some other people calling about I.O. I don't know if it's so much that I.O. is redundant on this team as it is this team just having a problem with players that need to prove it now you know what i mean i think to be where the bulls in the front office claim they want to be you know like a top four top six seed i think you know there's only so many rush spots you can use on your team you know with people who have to prove it i think this is patrick williams prove it season you know I, I, and i think that's what the coaches and everyone's looking forward to anyways is that it's pat and then you know you kind of have your new like babies to the family dalen terry and now even julian phillips and i just kind of got stuck in that middle child role you know and it's it's unfortunate i know a lot of people are like man you know caruso might get hurt or you know demar could leave caruso could walk i get all that but you see the signings that you make on the margins you know a Tyus jones a javon carter i don't know if we just have the room to let io prove it also you know we already got dalen like i said and pat maybe even Julian Phillips. And it's just kind of unfortunate timing, I think, for Isle. That's all it is. I mean, I hear people saying we might not have enough guards, but I think the guards that we have signed on the team, plus maybe Carly, plus, you know, Count Dalen, I just I just don't see it for Isle, even though, you know, I would love to see him stay. I would love to see him stay. But when you take the him being a Chicago kid out of it, you kind of just look at the archetype of the player. He can definitely improve. But, you know, is that what that top six, top four to six seed wants? I'm not sure, man. I don't know. I don't think he's, you know, I don't think it's redundant having him on the team. It's just, you know, only so many spots available. I but I wish him nothing but the best. And if he stays, I'm good with that too, man. But, all right, hey, take care, man. The middle, I think that's a very astute comparison, right? The middle child. I think, you know, here's the thing. Between Dalen, Io, Patrick Williams, now Julian Phillips, they all play very different positions and they all have very different upsides. But they have a lot of the same limitations, right? The shooting has not been the thing for a lot of the players. Now, Patrick Williams was their best three point shooter last season, but we just need him to take more of them, right? Um, so I think when you look at that ultimately, like, yeah, there is something to be said with that. But again, there's always, if you look at championship teams in the last few years, there are always a lot of guards on that team. And I think also you have to ask yourself this, like, while, okay, let's even say there's not a bunch of minutes for Io this season, right? Unless he earns those minutes. But what if he does, right? What it, you, like, And I do think that there is a little bit of that, right or wrong, with this front office now, that they do not want to continue to let their players walk away and develop elsewhere. Now, some of that is still on Io. Does he want to stay here? Is the contract offering that, that the Bulls are making towards him, is it something that he can he can take right for a long term is he going to bet on himself does that bet on himself work or doesn't it because i'll tell you what if i would assume who does take the qualifying offer rather than maybe a two three-year deal where he feels like he's getting paid less than he deserves if he takes that one-year tender that one-year qualifying offer and the bulls end up not playing him much or he ends up struggling again that could be the difference between you going to your next team or you having to show and prove and fight for another NBA spot, right? So that's it's a calculated risk that I and his agent have to decide to take this offseason. Do you take that risk in taking the qualifying offer? 
or do you try to work out something with the Chicago Bulls or maybe a two, maybe a three-year deal worth a little bit less than your qualifying offer, four and a half million, something like that? Got to ask themselves that. I don't envy the position that they're in at all, but I do think that the skill set that Io has, I think people forget, again, he was one of the best guard defenders in the NBA as a rookie. Not just, you know, one of the best for a rookie. As a rookie, he was one of, I think he was second only to Alex Caruso in the entire NBA. That potential, that ceiling, even if that is a ceiling, is a, there's a spot for that on every single NBA roster, in my opinion. All right, let's get into this next one. This one's from Oscar. Hey, it's Oscar here at Jersey. A um, couple things. One, I think fighting for the player uh, um, career-ending uh, exception next year kind of is probably what's going to happen, but I don't agree with it. If you look at next year's draft, uh, a free agent class, it's not the best class for us to be trying to make a big splash. And like a lot of these guys are in the last legs of their careers and are looking for one one last big payday. And that's not what, where I want to put in my – Oh, I don't want to put all my eggs in that basket. That's one. And two, going back to the Billy Donovan thing, is I, I really feel like like when AK took this job, and at the end of the guard packs era, these people were the United Center wasn't being packed. You know, people weren't buying tickets. The Ryan Dorf, the Ryan Dorf were feeling the the hit in their pockets, and that's what what forced them to make that move and get rid of uh, um, guard packs and bring, it, bring in Acme. But I feel like all the moves they made, including hiring Billy, Billy Donovan out of the blue, was just in desperation. We need a big-name coach, and we need, you know, we need to get butts back in the seat because, our, you know, our, our wallets aren't as big as they were uh, last year, so we got to get that right. So it, it almost feels like they hired that, uh, Billy and made the moves, and once they got, you know, we were the, the number one seed, and, once we're back in the seats and money was flowing back in, they say, you know what, we're good. Like, this ownership group is good enough. They just want to be good enough to put butts in the seat, and that's it. I, I don't I don't think that they ever really want to um, build the championship, like, go go the extra mile that it takes to, to, to build a consistent winner and, and a real championship-level team. They just want to be good enough to sell out the United Center and sell merchandise, and that's about it. But that's just my take on it. Let me know what you think. All right, so I have to disagree with Oscar on, A, the career-ending injury exception, if the Bulls file it, it, it being not a bad move. Because keep in mind, that gives you cap relief. It's not just to sign free agents. It's to trade. You can then take in way more salary than you have to send out, right? Because at that point, the Chicago Bulls would be looking at potentially having about 35 to, to $45 million in cap space, depending on what they do. That's that's the difference in that, right? It's not just and then we even I have to disagree as well when you look at some of the free agents available. Tyus Jones could be a free agent at that point in time. Could be. Not necessarily guaranteed, but could be a free agent at that time, right? So I gotta disagree with saying that it's 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 not something that would help the Bulls. I think it would help the Bulls absolutely tremendously. When you look at where the Bulls could be when with that, with all their cap holes, like you got to look, if the Bulls remove their cap holds, with DeMar DeRozan is coming into next season, a $42 million cap hold. That, that is $42 million. When you pair that with the $20 million of Lonzo Ball's contract, that's $63 million. What are the Bulls projected to be over the luxury tax next year? $65 million, right? And that's not even to say Andre Drummond's coming off the books. Um, uh, You know, uh, uh, at, there's a lot of players at that point, Patrick Williams as well. You know, he has a cap hold of $12, $29 million. He's not going to sign for that much. So the Bulls, that is the Bulls next time to make a, to make a move. And then when you look at, like I said, Tyus Jones is out there at that point. You don't even necessarily have to look at point guard. If you feel like if Javon Carter performs well, I would assume who makes the leap. Yeah, Alex Caruso, who another partly guaranteed deal next season, you don't necessarily have to look at point guard, right? And so there are absolutely players, Isaiah Hardenstein, other ones that can help the Bulls in areas next season if they decide to go that, air, that, that, that route. There are absolutely players that can help. So I would never say that cap space hurts. Cap space can't do nothing but help, especially if you're smart in how you use it. So if the Bulls do file the career ending, I mean, and plus, let's look at the alternative. You're paying $20 million to a player that's not playing. How does that not help your team to get that off the books and get usable salary out of that. 
That's kind of a short-sighted comment from Oscar, in my, um, in my opinion, on that one. As far as the Bulls' ownership, here's what I'll say always with Bulls' ownership. Yes, we talk about Bulls' ownership being cheap. We talk about Bulls' ownership not wanting to pay the luxury tax. But I think people forget as well that the team is over the salary cap every single year. Every single year. And so you can build a team with that. You just have to be smart. And I honestly think, right, and this is not to excuse because there are absolutely versions of this team over the years. Had we paid the luxury tax to keep together, we would have been able to build something more meaningful. So let me be clear in that. But what I'll say in this is that with the more penalized luxury tax area, a lot of teams are going to wish that they had spent years learning how to operate under the luxury tax like the Chicago Bulls have. It's just, it's just going to be facts when it comes to that. So I think that the, the front office has autonomy just not to go into the luxury tax. And paying the luxury tax isn't what guarantees you being a championship-level team. Drafting smart, being smart with your money, going after key free agents, and having a relatively healthy roster that just fits together is more important than, that, than, than just wholly paying the luxury tax. So, you know, AK and Eversley have to be smart. And I do think that we're going to see a lot of front offices forced to be more smart than what they have at the, at, in the past where they're able to just throw money at problems. Have we seen that from AK yet? That's the biggest question mark, in my opinion. But let me know what you guys think on that down below. But that's my time for today. Make sure you guys are following the show at Bull Central Pod. You can send us any feedback, questions, comments, concerns, bullcentralpod at gmail.com. Lastly, if you want to leave a text message and our voicemail for the show, the number to do so, 773-270-2799. We are the number one spot for everything Chicago Bulls related because of you guys. And like, like 10 every episode on. Go Bulls. Love you guys. See you right if you can, y'all. Peace. This has been a presentation of the Break Break Media. Media. Media.